This is one of the most important places in Constantinople, Istanbul, right here, this thing. And the reason why is not only did it establish, well, Constantine's empire here as the eastern half of the Roman Empire, but it really established it as the main part of the Roman Empire. This is a milestone. You guys all know what milestones are. Well, this is called the Golden Mile. This used to be, this, they, actually there is one, or there was one anyway, in Rome. You remember all roads lead to Rome? Well, there was a mile zero, and that was in Rome. But when they moved the empire here, when Constantine brought it here, this became mile zero. Everything began and ended right here. It's called the Milion or Milan or whatever you want to call it, but it's, the, it's mile zero. When it comes here, that establishes this as the capital. Now Rome has two capitals. And of course, the one in the, in the west is declining. It's defined, by the way, by its language. The dividing line between east and west was the dividing line between Latin and Greek. You know, you know how you've got a Latin Orthodox Church, which we know as the Catholic Church. And then you have the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is the Greek Orthodox Church. Again, the dividing line, Greek and Latin. But this particular thing here is when Constantine finally breaks, not breaks the empire in half, but recognizes this area as his administrative capital. And he puts up this milestone here. And the Via Ignatius, which is really the main thoroughfare. You would, in Rome, you would think about the, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the one that runs Appian north, Way. Appian Way. Thank you very much. Um, this getting old stuff is weird, isn't it? Anyway, the Appian Way would be the main road there. This one, of course, the Via Ignatius, which would have run uh, out of the city on the uh, on this side of the city going uh, out towards Greece through Macedonia and then eventually uh, splitting off at a place that we call Salonica or Thessalonica or Thessalonica and then going different directions from there. This is the way back to the other part of the empire. But it ended here. This was mile zero. Now the thing that's interesting about all of this that I wanted to point out was first of all that dot in there was the center of the world because that's where the emperors were crowned. But as far as the starting and stopping points, it made this the literal center of the empire, especially when the western half finally declined enough with all the barbarian invasions, pillaging of Rome and what have you, and finally they gave up on it as the capital city. So this was the center point, literally, of the Roman Empire in the east, which became the Roman Empire anywhere. This is it. But it's more than that. What you're looking at here is also the fulfillment of a prophecy. Fulfillment of a prophecy. Now, I need to go actually to it so I can read it to you, but you're going to find this actually very familiar. If I can get to the right place, where is it? It's right here. Um, Daniel was interpreting a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of a great statue with the head of gold, of course the shoulders of silver, arms of silver, chest of uh, bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And we know that of course as, as he was interpreting that, you have the head of gold which was the Babylonian empire, it's a splendid empire, it's uh, the, probably the most autocratic empire in the history of the world but also known as probably the most beautiful as far as what Nebuchadnezzar had thrown into it followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, which was the empires that sort of intersected, and you have the silver uh, you know, uh, shoulders, arms, two arms, Medo-Persian Empire, and the, and the chest, you've got the legs of iron. But you have two legs. And one leg would be one half of the empire, and this established the other leg. Daniel, chapter two. And this would indicate just one of the many things that happened, but really probably the most solid indicator of the fulfillment of that you have not only the legs of iron, which is Rome, but you had two legs. And this is the other leg, and this is the main place where you can say this really laid the groundwork for us to recognize what the Daniel, uh, what Nebuchadnezzar had as a prophecy and Daniel's interpretation of it. And it's right here. So I just thought you'd like to know that. Here we are in this amazing place, and you say, what biblical significance does it have? It's got huge biblical significance there in Jan Daniel chapter 2. Uh, one more thing, just for those of you who are kind of war buffs, uh, I think most of the guys are anyway. Yes, I heard a big yes from the back. Okay, the Theodosian walls that we went along today, 
They're huge. They're massive, as you can tell. But the first wall that was built was the constant, well, the Byzantine wall, which was in this direction over here, oh, several hundred yards. And this whole section down to the water, which is like a peninsula to a point, uh, was the ancient Byzantine city of Byzantium, obviously. Across the way was another city, which is called Chalcedon. Maybe you've heard of the, um, um, the Council of Chalcedon. It's one of the famous church councils. And it took place over there. But Chalcedon existed way before this city came into existence around the seventh century BC. Chalcedon, uh, in that direction was also, well, in, in a sense, prophesied, if you can call it that, I'm, I'm really reticent to do that, from the Oracle of Delphi as the city of the blind. And the reason they called it that is because if you take a good look, especially on a map or a satellite picture of this peninsula, you realize that strategically this is the most important piece of land for a city perhaps the world has ever known, except for the strip of Israel with all the trade routes going through it, that would make that far superior to this. But as a defensible piece of property, this is it. You have the Golden Horn on one side, and then you have the Sea of Marmara on the other, and you have this, this hilly peninsula terracing down towards the water. It's surrounded by water on three sides. So the Byzantines build a wall across the back side here. But then along come the Romans, and Septimus Severus builds a wall a little bit further out, making expanding the city because the city is just getting bigger because it's in a very, very strategic location. You have all the way from the Adriatic Sea through the Hellespont down there, here to the Bosphorus and out to the Black Sea, which means you can run trade routes to Central Asia or invasions if you want. So that also made this place not only strategic but very vulnerable. Along comes Constantine, and he decides we're really going to make the city big and we're going to defend it. He goes a mile and a half out from the existing wall, takes a plow, and ceremoniously plows a furrow north and south across this thing, this peninsula right here, and they build his wall. But later on, here comes Theodosius, and he goes out another full mile. And those are the walls that you saw today, those great big walls. And he builds what's called the Theodosian Walls, which stood until the invention of gunpowder. Gunpowder, no wall was, was, uh, could ever keep out anything fired by gunpowder. But up until then, those walls from the time of Theodosius I, all the way up until gunpowder was invented into the 1400s, when they started using it, those walls were impenetrable. And here's why. There were three of them. What you saw, was the main wall. But in front of the first wall, there was a moat, just a dry moat that ran the full length of this whole wall. And then you had an open space of land past the moat. So if you're an enemy attacking these walls, you'd have to cross the moat, and then you'd have to be in an open space of land, vulnerable, and people are firing everything they can at you from these battlements. So finally you take one of the gates or the battlements, and you go through the other side. You have a bigger wall, 40 meters away, an open space with no obstructions. You're dead. You can't get across that deadly space. But if you could, then you could somehow blast a hole in that wall or climb over it or go through maybe in a, a gate in that. You go through there and you have another big open space with a moat and another wall. Those walls were never penetrated until gunpowder. It was the most secure place in the world to be. And as DeLake will tell you the history of this, it went through all these different surges of actually going to rubble and poverty into the most magnificent city, rebuilt, rebuilt again, rebuilt again, so that it was really the splendor, not only the empire, but it was the largest city in the world for centuries, right here. And it was kept safe because of that wall and that body of water out there when ships attacked, if the currents would carry the ships, it would dash them up on the rocks on the way out to the Black Sea. So this place was incredibly secure, which made it incredibly important. And you can use that word incredible a lot when talking about the city. But this is the million, this is the milestone. Here it is right here, the beginning and end of all Rome, the second leg of that statue. Prophetically speaking, there you go. So, all right, amen. amen.